My name is Steve Lupar. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the annual Barbara Hill Lecture. Barbara Hill is with us today, so I want to acknowledge Barbara. Thank you very much. Barbara was the longtime deputy director of the museum and is still an active participant in the, in the work of the museum. So it's just a delight to have her here, to have her be the, have this lecture series named after her, and especially today to be able to have as our speaker for the Barbara Hill Lecture, uh, another member of the Hoffmanneffer Museum family. Uh, Margot Cheville was an undergraduate and a graduate student at Brown. Uh, curator at the museum, uh, did many different projects at the museum, um, and has since gone on to a, a quite spectacular career as a expert in, in textiles, especially in Guatemalan textiles. And there's another connection that pleases me enormously today, and that's that this long-time brown Guatemalan textiles, uh, Margot Cheville, Barbara Hell <coughs> story is continuing with two students who are now working on this collection that Margot has donated to the museum to do an exhibition. So, Anna Duplakian and Maria Quintero, who are at the back there someplace, are now cataloging the collection, uh, spending a lot of time talking to Margot, which is, explains why she's hoarse today. Um, and they will be doing an exhibition that ties this collection of Guatemalan textiles to a, a cooperative with Guatemalan weavers in New Bedford. Uh, and that ex exhibition will open May 11th at the John Nicholas Brown Center. So lots of good Brown connections, and it's really sort of wonderful to see the history of the museum uh, tied back together and you know, keeping the process of education and research and exhibitions going uh, over all these years. So it's just wonderful to see that. So you'll all get invitations to the May 11th exhibition. Uh, just one or two uh, announcements. There's a reception after the talk at the museum right across the street. Uh, it's a beautiful day to walk over. Uh, you'll see some, those of you who haven't been there for a while, we have several new exhibits and new projects to, to take a look at. And I'm told to warn you that the reception, the, the food that's right out at the back of the auditorium is actually a student reception for a student project and do not steal their food. <laughs> so with that, it's an absolute pleasure and delight to introduce Margot. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Be sure to tell me if you can hear me. Yes? Okay. Collecting identity. Adventures of a museum anthropologist in Guatemala and elsewhere. <clears throat> Thanks to Jolie, to Katie, and others for inviting me. Thanks to Barbara Hale for all her support over the years. Most of the images are by Jeffrey J. Fox, my colleague, and myself. I'd like to begin with a few lines that relate to Guatemalan textiles by the Nobel laureate Miguel and Hannah. Asturias, 1974. So many symbols, spells, sayings, stars, and conjectures are warped in their cloth. Now, I will first, I will talk first about where Guatemala, then who, the Maya, and finally, what? Following the words of James Clifford in Predicament of Culture, 1988, who wrote that collections as artifacts reveal the act of, quote, collecting ourselves, our obsessions, recollections, curiosities, art, and evidence of our travels. I will talk about the collections I have worked with, including my own and what they reveal about collectors. Where? Guatemala. Not yet. Still? No, I'm sorry, it's changing my tone. Probably switch the slideshow in the back. It's not a matter of time. It's going to fall. 
42 square miles, the size of Ohio, <coughs> population numbers over 18 million people, 59% are Latino, people of mixed indigenous, Spanish, and European ancestry, who own most of the land. 40.5% are indigenous Maya, 21 language and ethnic groups, most live in the Altiplano or high plateau, while the largest Ladino population in, it lives in Guatemala City and its urban area. There are 22 departments and 329 municipalities. Okay, uh, six, five slides. Did we skip one? Okay. Volcanoes, jungle, keep going. Fertile coastlands in southeast coffee and other plantations and east arid flatlands. Keep going. Keep going. That's it. Why Maya textiles? And keep going for uh, six slides. A variety of styles, colors, materials, techniques. Often the community of origin is indicated by dress or traje. It's a vibrant, ongoing tradition. Keep going. Now the link of the ancient Maya to the living Maya. And nine slides. Palenque, Yashilan, a lintel at Yashilan, which shows the beautiful clothing that was worn. That's a backstrap weaver, a ceramic figure from the island of Hainan. A mother teaching her daughter to weave from Codex Mendoza. Mural at Bonam Park. The women are wearing long gauze like blouses called huipiles. A Quetzaltenango woman wearing such a huipil. And an example from a museum collection. Two backstrap weavers from Samak Altavedipas who continue weaving and wearing gauze like white cloth. We do legs. Not space. Okay. Who? My story. How I got started. I had been collecting southwestern textiles and folk art and was a weaver. I took Jane Powell Dwyer's class on tribal arts and I knew that a material culture project was for me. As it came time to develop a field work plan towards my master's thesis in anthropology. Although Jane's research was with archaeolog archaeological textiles in Peru, I told her I wanted to work with living weavers as a participant observer, which was a field work practice in the 1970s. She offered me a collection grant to buy for the Hoffenreffer Museum, where she was director. Her advice was, buy what you see people wearing, not just ceremonial garments. Get technical information and take careful notes. She also advised me not to ask for design meanings, and that was the best advice, for I discovered that each person I talked to had a different idea. Even in the weaving family I studied with. A Brown student of my husband, Jim Chevilles, recommended an indigenous weaving teacher. 
Rafaela Godinez in San Antonio Aguas Calientes. I connected with her through the Brown student and we made a plan for spring 1978. We rented a house outside of Antigua. This is what San Antonio looks like from the bus, my first trip, and I took the, trip, the photograph through the bus. I took the bus to San Antonio, work with the family, as all of them were weavers. It was one, two years after the earthquake, and the town had been totaled, so this is just what the street looked like. Okay. Besides Rafaela, there was her daughter Graciela, her sons Edgar and little Marco Tulio, and her mother Vicenta. This is Graciela, and next. Rafaela, Vicenta, and me. My Spanish, the lingua franca of Guatemala, was adequate, but not excellent. However, the family spoke Cachiquel, one of the 21 languages already mentioned, as well as Spanish. The backstrap loom was new for me, and that's me. No hard copy instructions, mm -hmm. just someone sitting next to me pointing out what to do. I spent one day a week at the Museo Michel del Trajea Indigena in Guatemala City, looking at a range of material to teach myself the, the visual indicators of each community, techniques involved, gender and age categories. While at the museum, I was able to observe another class of society <coughs> who had created this museum just a few years earlier. My other informant was a man who ran a successful store that sold typical material. And he knew a lot about the weavers from whom he bought and or commissioned textiles. I came to realize that my address, clothing, and cloth all serve as cultural artifacts or signs, speaking in a silent language and communicating information visually without benefit of words. All this material in great detail went into my Master of Arts thesis. The persistence of Maya Indian weaving in San Antonio Aguas Calientes, Zacatepeques in 1981. And that is when I started collecting too. This is the weepill woven by Edgar, the son, and commissioned for the museum collections. I counted the hours that it took him to weave them, 572 hours. Next. Another weave hill. I learned the names of all the typical designs in Spanish and the colors. There's a great range of color and it's not just like light blue and dark blue, but it's another word. Next. A wedding outfit from San Antonio that we had in the museum exhibit. To space. Stopping off in California from Rhode Island, I met principal museum anthropologist at the Lowy Museum, UC Berkeley, Frank Norick who knew Jane Dwyer and allowed me to look at some of the Gustavus Eisen collection of Guatemalan textiles gathered in 1902. I had heard about the collection in Guatemala and also the work of anthropologist Lila M. O'Neill, who was commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation to study Highland textiles of Guatemala the title of a book published in 1944. After three months of field work and eight years preparation, she was a technical specialist, while Eisen was a natural scientist from Sweden, fascinated by Maya archaeology. More about them later. 
Next, back to the Hoffendreffer Museum and the Costumist Communication Project that included an exhibition, catalog, touring exhibition, symposium, and another book, a spin-off from the symposium. The focus was on the two largest ethnographic dress and textile collections outside of North America in the museum at that time, Middle America and Central Andes. The collection was mostly field collected and well documented by brown related people, faculty of the anthropology department, students, staff, and friends of the museum, and some additional purchases from dealers who collected in the field. I asked myself why traditional dress and cloth production persisted in certain areas of Middle America and the Central Andes. Some factors are, one, geographic isolation, two, continuance of markets and the fiesta cycle, three, symbolization of town ideals in dress, four, differentiation of civil religious hierarchies or cofradias through dress. Five, lower cost of handwoven textiles compared to commercial goods. But that was before pack, which are bales of used clothing shipped from the U.S. and sold very cheaply in Guatemala. A theoretical framework was offered by Roland Barth, writing in the Fashion System, 1983. He organized garments into three categories. Image clothing, that which is photographed or drawn. Written clothing, that which is described with words. And real clothing, that which is technically described in relation to construction, materials, and other elements. He goes on to comment that a garment can magically transform the person. The person transforms the garment and is expressed through it. There is a dialectical exchange between person and garment, an awareness of self and the transformed self simultaneously. This is particularly present in Maya dances and fiestas. As costumes are rented, participants become other than they really are briefly. With this theoretical structure in place, the theory came alive through exhibitions, continual field work, and the study of collections in Guatemala and the United States. Because of the <clears throat> political, excuse me, <clears throat> because of the political situation now called the period of violence, I did not return to Guatemala until the summer of 1988 and reunited with the family, which had grown over 10 years. All grandchildren were taught to weave, male or female. Many of them still weave. In the fall, we spent a semester in Berkeley while I was working on a book about Eisen and his collection. This is Eisen. Maya Textiles of Guatemala, 1993. University of Texas Press, partially funded by the NEA. Being a scientist, Eisen included notes, place names, where he purchased the garments, and comments. <clears throat> Next. As are the textiles. The photographs he took are some of the earliest and best documented that have become invaluable to historians of Guatemala. Next. This is the serape that the man in the previous slide was wearing. He bought the clothing off the. 
Certainly the Eisen collection reflects his interest in art, anthropology, and context. My attention was drawn at that time, again, to Lila M. O'Neill. I had the opportunity to look at her collections in field notes, which contained explicit technical aspects of the textiles and some contextual knowledge, all of which is available in her book, Highland Textiles of Guatemala, still a Bible for textile scholars. She included many of Eisen's examples as well. She's on the Klamath River. Uh, her dissertation was based on her field work there with the Yorok Kara basket weavers. And a marvelous headcloth from Chichi that she collected. By the time my book on the Eisen collection came out, we were living in Berkeley, and I was cataloging another large Guatemalan textile collection at the Hearst Museum, funded by the NEH. The collector, kind of hard to see him, he looks more mysterious. <laughs> it's a mystery man who I never met. The collection was donated by a friend, and it is a diverse and fascinating one. Whitaker lived in Antigua in the 1970s and ran a weaving school. <clears throat> it was the time when the evangelical movements were becoming active in Guatemala. The Cofredia textiles, these are especially fine and valued, were offered for sale as the evangelicals did not favor the civil religious organizations called Cofredias an old tradition from the time of the Spaniards. For example, Whitaker was able to buy 20 or more ceremonial weepilts from various towns. He left no field books, and there was no publication of the collection, but it exemplifies his fascination with the ceremonial and highly valued material. These are his helpers, young women, from San Antonio, Aguas Calientes. Which brings me back to my collection, which I have donated to the Hoffenreffer Museum, and my relationship with the Godinus Oppen family. Next. In 1989, Edgar was attending Johnson in Wales on a scholarship. And we invited him to the Hoffenreffer Museum at that time to do a weaving <coughs> demo. Yes. Next. He's in my backyard setting up a loom for an article I was writing. Then in 2000, while Edgar was living in the U.S. as a legal immigrant, he wrote his life story in English. Edgar's story, A Maya Life from the Highlands of Guatemala. I edited it and tried unsuccessfully to get it published. It is a remarkable story, a popular subject for films these days, about his tenacity to go north, and he did make it. Although he is not a polished writer, nor is English his first language, I believed in it and did not want to rewrite. Maybe one day some graduate student will take an interest. <laughs> Rafaela often gave weaving demonstrations in different parts of the country. And this is Laguna Beach, and I'm here with my daughter and my granddaughter. Next. With Rafaela at their home prepared for a wedding fiesta, I've been able to attend, well, three weddings with the family. Another family group for a tour that I was working with. The little boys are wearing traditional male traje, which is no longer in use in San Antonio. In closing, I come full circle and back to my collection gathered from 1977 to 2011. 
It does represent the original advice given to me by Jane. It numbers over 200 textiles from 13 departments, bought mostly directly from the Maya and some from dealers. Over 33 textiles are from the Godinas family in San Antonio. For over 34 years, I've been able to follow change and innovation in designs, colors, materials, and techniques, my ongoing research theme. <clears throat> Just a little example. This is a woman's utility cloth from San Antonio from the 1950s. It's relatively simple with just a few designs in it. By 1980, they had become much more complex. And at the wedding two years ago, the whole cloth is covered with these beautiful floral designs. Next. Changes in the Weepill design. Uh, the baby's hat is called Agora. And I brought two with me here to share with you. Um, originally, they were much simpler. Next. And the one on the left is the one we commissioned from Edgar for our first grandchild, who is now 37 years old. <laughs> And this is Edgar's wedding. Next. One month ago in Antigua with Edgar, Angelina, and Naomi Angelina. My ongoing work focuses on exhibitions and has involved curatorial opportunities and looking at several large Guatemalan collections in the U.S. as a consultant. For one collection, I will curate an exhibition in 2014 at the Spurlock Museum, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. And finally, advice for students. Try to have a focus plan before you do field work. <laughs> My focus on one community, San Antonio, prepared me for working with textiles from other communities. I learned the language, I learned so many things. Be aware of the political situation where you're going. Mm -hmm. But also be prepared for the unexpected, as Robert J. used to tell us. Be flexible and keep in touch. Thank you. <laughs> clothing when they left the community because they were identified with that area and they were killed. Mm -hmm. Now, as it happens now within the last 20 years, um, people are weaving again. But it's not like it used to be. But they're beautiful. So what can I say? Yes? To what do you attribute the elaboration of designs in the past uh, it seems to be to customary. People start out with less and they end up with more. That's what I think. You know, more is better than little. And those uh, double-sided designs, like this is the baby hat. And it's a very difficult technique. It's the same on both sides. And San Antonio's the one town that really, really perfected this early on. And I think the idea, 
This is this is from the 1940s. This is my treasure. I can't give this to the museum, Terry. <laughs> it was a gift from me, for me, from the grandmother. But it's just, there's much more solid color. The designs are also two-sided. But that's quite an evolution in 50 years. That's my answer. Barbara? Was the family that you worked with unusual in having uh, multiple weavers and both male and female weavers? Or was this, um, I mean, were they considered artists in their community? Um, the, the father figure in the family just did not provide enough income. So Rafaela took it on her own to become not only, uh, she was a weaver, but she became a vendor. And she was very successful. She taught each one of the children to weave. And it was unusual that there would be a male backstrap weaver. And he only wove inside his, the confines of his home. But here's the twist. Now he tells me um, he lives part time in Arizona where he just picks up whatever kind of work he can to send the money to Guatemala to help his family. Um, he says, I think I'm going to start weaving again. And I said, wonderful. So I believe they were unusual in that respect. Yeah? Did they weave primarily to uh, generate income, or did they also, were they able to wear the beautiful things? Oh, yeah. You just saw it. They, they originally wove for themselves, but even in Eisen's time, in 1902, they were weaving for sale. And my teacher told me, you can always see the difference in the quality of the work. The ones that are being woven for their own use are finer. And so I thought that was fascinating, that there were always tourists there, like Eisen. Yeah. Um, to what extent are people in Guatemala wearing the uh, woven... She's art. asking me to what extent are people still wearing traditional clothing. Um, it varies. Uh, my sense is the tourists love to see the typical clothing. So in a place like Lake, Lake Atitlan, where so many tourists come, um, you, the women are wearing it all the time. The men, not so much anymore. And I always realized that when the men had to go work, leave their families and go work on the plantations, they left their uh, indigenous clothing at home because it, that immediately signaled them to be indigenous. And that was very difficult and still is in Guatemala. Yeah? Does that answer that? Yes. A question. Everything you've shown has been done by a certain family and in their houses. Not house. everything. Well, many of them. Is there such a thing as an industry that's been created and so they, you know, manufacture You mean do they weave not <coughs> for themselves? Pardon? You, you mean do they weave for other people? Is that what you mean? You know, sold in the market mm -hmm. for anything. We, there are production weavers, even in San Antonio, production weavers, because I learned that not every girl likes to weave, and she'd much rather be out of the house selling textiles than at home weaving them. So she would have the money to com commission a beautiful weave pill for herself. Uh, and industry, yes, it is an industry. Everywhere you go, you can buy textiles for sale. And I was telling the students today, one of the most kind of interesting sale, sad in a way though, in Panahashel, in front of the uh, fire station, every Friday morning, you can go to a sale of textiles, and women come from all over and bring what they have for sale. It's not necessarily from their own hometown. So. One thing, I've been down there quite often, and for instance, one thing that I, I always look for 
placemats. Now, it's impossible that you, you can turn out that many without doing it in some sort of an industrial setting. Well, I don't know how you can find industry. What they do yeah. is they can, <clears throat> they can warp a loom and they can weave six placemats on one warp. Then they cut them apart and sell them. Actually, when I first came back and started working at the museum, <laughs> I used to receive them from the family for sale, and Joan Ritchie would sell them in her shop, The Peaceful Kingdom, <laughs> and I was trying to help out. I also tried to sell a typical textiles, but nobody seemed to want to pay the price that they were worth, and I was not going to sell them cheaply because they represented so much labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, is there a difference between the source for uh, yarn and material now versus when you first started your study? The material? Are the materials different? Yeah. Well, they, yes. Now they have metallic yarn. Um, <laughs> it's very popular. Uh, a lot of synthetics have come. I always defend the use of synthetics because I know they're cheaper and they cover the warp faster, but they don't last as long. But they, it's what the people want to use themselves. That's what I was interested in. Um, silk, a lot of people have asked me about silk. It was always imported. And even when I was doing my field work in the late 70s, not in San Antonio, but in another town I worked in, Santa Maria. The women would go to Guatemala City and spend a lot of money on this. It wasn't tightly spun. It was more like a roving or bulk. And their textiles were worth a lot of money. But now, when I went to the market in Chichi recently, I saw spun silk for sale. And I said, where is it coming from? And they said, China. So, anything else? Yeah? Have cooperatives been very successful? You know, my teacher didn't want to join a cooperative. She said it, um, it would, she would lose money by doing that. They have various cooperatives, but usually they're not developed by the indigenous people themselves. It's other people who come in and develop the cooperative. And then, um, the best example I know is one called Maya Traditions. And um, my friend who's deceased now uh, started it with the idea of working with four communities and finding things that the people could weave that she could market in the U.S. because she had a wholesale business. And that really, really worked. And they're still going. They're still in Panahashel and um, they're called Fundaciones Mayas. You can look them up, you can Google them. Um, and talking about placemats, they make placemats, they make glass cases, they make a variety of things. And the money is used to fund medicinal workshops for the women. Um, they have a garden that the women can use. Education for the children. That is number one, number one. Everybody wants their children to have education. Um, so the co-ops come and they go. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Okay. Barbara. I noticed in um, some of the pictures, especially uh, one with the child with the green blouse on, and flowers on it appear to be embroidered rather than uh, woven. Well, they do. They're do they, great. I get do they, They're great embroiders, Barbara. I, yeah. But the women who weave <coughs> don't usually embroider. I see. Okay. It's okay. you know separated. Okay. Well, feel free to come look at the beautiful textiles. Thank you.